Well, good evening. I'm glad you came tonight. Excited to share with you. If you don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Zach. I'm the middle school pastor here. And we're wrapping up a series tonight called Don't Be a Grinch. Turn to your neighbor and say, Don't Be a Grinch. Anyone in here say that maybe you're a little bit of a Grinch come Christmas time? Anybody get, who's, a, who's the Grinch that gets mad at people who put up their tree before Thanksgiving? Any of those people? Okay. Then you don't like me because my tree's been up for a little while. Who's had their tree up since before Thanksgiving? Okay. Uh, Jamie? Stilos have? Yeah, that's, that's people who, I heard so many people this year say that their tree went up way earlier than normal, and it's just because they just need that, that joy in their house, right? That, you know the joy that the Christmas tree brings. But there's some Grinch people, and I get that, but we're looking at uh, this series on generosity, and you've heard a couple messages. Tonight, we're going to wrap it up talking about serving. We're talking about serving, so if you're taking notes, you can write that on your, on your paper. We're going to be going through, uh, I've got just a short message, got 10 points for you. You laugh, but I'm actually being serious. It's going to be fun. So if you're taking notes, make sure you get that out. We're going to be going through some scriptures, through some points. Uh, but serving is part of the DNA at New Hope. If you've gone to New Hope for a while, you know that serving is a big part of who we are. If you know Pastor Weaver, he is the biggest servant of them all. And, and that's just part of our DNA. We have a lot of people here who serve. And maybe tonight you're in a spot where you do not serve anywhere. Or maybe... You could serve more in other areas, or maybe you have been serving, and tonight, hopefully, this is a reminder to you of why you serve, or hopefully, this is encouragement to you to, this is why you should serve. So I want to give you 10 reasons why you sh should serve, all right? Turn your name and say, you should serve. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The first reason tonight why you should serve is this, is I was created for service. You were created for service. The gifts that you have, the gifts that you have been given are from God for his service. Maybe you've noticed something at church. Maybe you've walked in and you've been like, oh man, the greeters just aren't friendly enough. Or, oh man, I wish worship could be this way. Oh man, I, the, the kids department, it's just crazy. Or, or, oh man, the youth department, don't even get me started on the youth department. Oh, oh those parking lot people, if they were in, at an airport doing that, there would be plane wrecks everywhere, right? And you've had some critiques about things. But maybe... You've had those thoughts because God's placed them in your head and you were created with the skills that you have and the insight you have to make a difference in serving. Maybe that department or that area would be better if you would serve. I say this in youth all the time, that you are made on purpose, that you are here on purpose for a purpose. You, it's not a mistake that, that you're here. It's not a mistake that you live in Iowa, in Urbandale, in Des Moines area, that you go to New Hope and you're not... You were on purpose, and that is for a purpose. You were created to serve. 2 Timothy 1.9, it is he who saved us and chose us for his holy work. So number one, I was created for service. Number two, I am saved for service. I don't know if you had this thought, but maybe you did. When you first gave your life to Christ, did you notice that like, you weren't instantly zapped into heaven? Like, maybe you're surprised. You're like, okay, I'm going to give my life to Christ, and then boom, I'm in heaven. And look at you, you're still here. So either we all did a bad job of accepting Jesus, and we didn't do it right, or God has us here for a reason. That there's, there's a reason that we are here. There's some stuff for us to do. He has saved us, not just to save us, but he saved us for served, to serve him. He saved us from hell for his service. Galatians 1.15, but God in his grace chose me even before I was born and called me to serve him. So we see I was created for service, I am saved for service, and number three, I am called to service. And you're thinking, well, Pastor Zach, you, you can say that we are called to serve because you were called to be a pastor, and that's, that's your job to do. Or that missionary, they, they were called to the mission field. But did you know that you are just as called as I am? You're just as called as Pastor Weaver is. You're just as called as Pastor Brett is. Turn your arm and say, you are called. That was like half of you. Turn to the neighbor you just ignored because maybe they look funny and say, you are called. 
You're just as called as I am. People ask sometimes, they say, well, how many pastors do you have at New Hope? And they're like really surprised that we have, what do we have now? I'm so confused with Pastor Hawkins leaving. If you didn't know, Pastor August accepted the position and he's going to be starting with us here soon. Do we have 13, Pastor Brian? He doesn't even know. He's in charge of all of us. He doesn't even know. 13? 12? No one knows, all right? We have 11, I must say that, and a half. 20. All right, so say we had 20 pastors, right? That's how many staff members we have, but I believe that every single person here is called, and you are called to admit to be a minister where you are at. So really, I should say, well, we have over 2,000 pastors at our church, and there's a few people who work in the office to administrate all of that. You are called to be a minister where you are at. You are called to spread the gospel where you are at. You are called to be the pastor. Turn your neighbor and say, you are a pastor. Think about that. Jesus, think what Jesus did, how much he changed the world with 12 people. Think what New Hope can do with our resources with over 2,000 people. If we recognize that, I am called. You are called. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. You have special abilities. Turn to your and say, you're special. Don't say it mean, like it's, it's nice, okay? I heard some attitude coming from right up here. You are special. Number four is I am gifted for service. Why should you serve? Because you are gifted for service. You have a talent. It is to be used for service. I've noticed that many times people don't want the gift that they have. Maybe that's you. And you've, you've been given a gift from God, and you're like, well, I don't really like my gift. I wish I could be the person speaking up front. That's a way cooler gift. I wish I could sing and lead worship like Pastor Brett now. If I had a gift like that, then I would, I'd be using my gifts for God. And we, we say, well, my gift isn't as important. But hear me, just because your gift isn't the first gift or the main gift people see when they come into church doesn't mean that your gift isn't valuable. There's not like this level of like this gift is more valuable than this gift. No, if you've been gifted, it is valuable. It is necessary. They're not elevated over each other. All of us are needed in the body of Christ, right? This is a body of Christ and every part is needed. I don't know about you, but I don't want to like lose a part off my body, right? Even my toe, like I want my, I want to keep my toe. I don't want to just lose it. I heard this story of this MLB pitcher and I don't remember who it was, but he was an MLB pitcher, had this good contract and he uh, broke a toe and was never able to pitch again. Had to forfeit his whole contract because he broke a toe. Something so small and so minor. But every part is needed. It's every part is necessary. Every gift is there for a reason. You've been gifted on purpose. We're all needed. Whether it's a gift in administration or, or tidying up. Maybe you don't know this, but after every service, people come in and, and clean up and, and wipe everything down. If they didn't, it would be a mess in here. Right? Maybe your gift is you're just friendly and you'd be a great person at the door. Or maybe it's in tech and you could jump in the sound booth or on the stream team. All of these things, that, those are a big deal. And we cannot get caught up in being jealous of other gifts. Like, I, I'm glad that my feet are not jealous of my nose. My feet are supposed to run and my nose is supposed to smell. If they get jealous and do the other thing, that's bad news. Smelly feet, runny nose, right? Your gifts are on purpose. They're needed where they're at. Every part's a big deal. Different, but necessary. And here's, here's what I, I was thinking when I was thinking through this message about serving. And here's one thought that I, that I love, is that you can't fake serving. You can't fake being a servant. Like you're either showing up to serve or you're not showing up to serve. Like you can fake holiness kind of, right? Like you can throw in a lot of like, oh, praise God. Like, oh, I'm so blessed. Hallow like you can throw in a lot of those words and seem super spiritual, but you can't fake being a servant and serving. And maybe you're single in here or maybe you know someone that's single. I would say if you're single, I would never date someone who doesn't serve in church. Because if that person won't serve in God's house, they won't serve God in God's house, why would they serve you in their house? Serving is a big deal. Serving is a, is a true 
tell of how we are doing spiritually, I would say. Shows who's serious about their faith. You either show up to serve or you don't. So number four, I'm gifted for service. Matthew 20, 28 says this, your attitude must be like my own. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve. Number five, I am commanded to serve others. I am commanded to serve others. This tells me when, how Jesus is saying this is that serving isn't an option. It's not, should I serve, shouldn't I serve? It's that we're commanded to do it. Jesus commands it. When Jesus showed up here on earth, he didn't show up like, hey, I am the son of God. Come serve me, come worship me. No, he showed up and he did the opposite. He washed feet. He did miracles. Maybe you don't recognize that, but doing miracles, that was Jesus serving those people. He served us so much that he got on the cross and died a brutal death serving you. That's something to be thankful for. I'm commanded to serve others. Yeah, but I don't know. Like if, I, if, that, if I'm serving, that means I got to wake up extra early and come serve with the snotty kids before my service and, and waking up early, that's just, ah, uh, that's, that's tough. Or, I, or that means I got to stay after my service that I go to and then I can't go to lunch right away. I'm going to miss the first part of the football game. Like that's just, that's, that's not going to be very convenient for me. Or you know what, my, my week, it's just, it's so busy. And on Wednesdays, it's, it, I'm just tired on Wednesday, and 6.30 rolls around, and I know the youth need help, but like that's, that's just so inconvenient for me. Maybe you didn't know this, but in youth, we need people to serve. And I don't care how old or how young you are. I was just telling my dad a while ago that I would love to have a, grand, a set of grandparents for every grade through youth. There's lots of kids who don't have grandparents. There's lots of kids who don't have parents, and we need people to serve in youth. At one point, not that long ago, I had one, small, one of my small groups, because we break it up into grade and gender, was one leader with 72 girls. We need people to serve. But you know what, that's just, that's tough because my day is so long, and, and those kids, like the stuff that teenagers are into now, like, that kind of makes me uncomfortable. You know what was uncomfortable? Getting on a cross and dying, serving you. That's uncomfortable. We're not called to be comfortable as a church. Comfort zones, I've said this before, comfort zones, they don't keep our life safe, they, they keep your life small. And what you'll see is that serving opens it up and you can see the world in a whole new way. Serving makes you most like Jesus because he came to serve us. I love that verse though, it says your attitude must be like my own. I love that, that that doesn't just tell us like, hey, you should serve, but it tells us the attitude that we should have while we're serving. That we shouldn't just show up and just have this bad attitude, but, but we show up and we have an attitude like Jesus that says, hey, I'm a servant and I'm here to serve wherever, whenever, however you want. I, I'm, I'm just here to make Jesus famous. I'm just here to make people feel welcome. But sometimes we get this sense of entitlement when it comes to serving, like, no, I signed up to serve in this department at this time, and I can't stay late, I can't be here too early, I'm here at this time, and that's my commitment to serving. Are we serving others, or are we serving ourselves? But, but we're here to serve. First Corinthians 12, 27 says this, all of you together are the one body of Christ, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. Point number six is this. My church family needs my service. My church family needs my service. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need me. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you need me too. Turn to someone across the room and say, hey, you, you need me. Yeah, that's right, you need me. Has anyone ever heard of uh, a football player named Brian Bosworth. Anyone ever heard of him? He went by the Boz. When I was stuck at home in quarantine, I watched a lot of 30 for 30s on ESPN. Anyone ever see the 30 for 30s on ESPN? They're awesome, just little like short documentaries on something. 
Well, Brian Bosworth, the Boz, was a crazy good football player who played for Oklahoma. And he got drafted, and they expected him just to be this big, hot shot, amazing player, uh, linebacker, I believe, in the NFL. But the thing was that he only lasted a year and a half in the NFL. He was this big expected player, only a year and a half. What happened? Well, he got this shoulder injury, and the, the doctors checked on him. And after looking at him, they said this, you are 25 years old, but you have the back and the shoulders of a 60-year-old man. And he was, his NFL career was done at that point. And what they discovered was in college he was great, but the NFL, they started bulking up more. And this happens to lots of players in the NFL that their, their frame can't support the muscle mass that they gain in the NFL. Their, their skeleton isn't built to hold as much muscle as they're putting on it, and it ends up destroying them. Their frame, it can't keep up. Let me ask you something. How many would love if New Hope in the next year grew by 1,000 people? 1,000 more people came to New Hope. 1,000 more people came to Jesus, and we grew and grew. You know what that would mean? That would mean there would be over, I was trying to do the math with my dad, over 120 new babies in the early childhood department. 150 more kids in the kids department, 150, 200 more kids in the youth department. There would be about 400 more cars every Sunday. Are we ready for that? Do we have the servants for that? Because we can't grow until the frame grows. Reaching more people is great. Outreach is great, but if we want to grow bigger, our inreach has to grow. The amount of people serving, making up that frame, it has to grow. We can't just be a church that comes in and consumes we got to be a church that is the frame that, that welcomes people in. How many people, how many Walmart shoppers do we have here? How many Walmart watchers do we have here? Like, you're just like, I'll just go to Walmart and just walk around and see what's going on at Walmart. Maybe you've experienced this before, uh, especially late at night, but you know those runs where you're like, oh man, I need, I need milk, or, or if you're at my house and you realize that you don't have coffee for the next morning, you're like, we have to get coffee tonight so that my morning is okay when I wake up, right? Anybody like that? Like if you're out of coffee, the coffee has to be purchased before the morning happens, otherwise it's bad news, yeah, that's me. So say that's the case, and you're like, all right, I'm gonna go to Walmart quick and pick that up, and you're walking through Walmart, and if you're like me, it's probably like this, you end up like walking down the snack aisle, and you've got like Oreos and popcorn, and you got like all sorts of other snacks, and you went just to buy milk, and you end up leaving with like, a new mortgage payment and a dog, right? And you're like, what, how did I get all this stuff? But maybe this has happened to you before and it's late at night and you've got a full cart of stuff and you're at Walmart and you get up to the front and what do you see? One person working in the long line off that one person. Anybody ever been there before? You're like, oh my goodness. And you turn and there's like the self checkout line, but you know that you scan one item and it's like, need assistance, please wait. And you're like, oh my goodness, this is horrible, right? You know what I'm talking about. Isn't it crazy that Walmart, a massive store, multi-million dollar store, has one person serving, has one person working up at the front. And you can go to this giant store this multi-million dollar store, you can come to a, a giant church, a, a million dollar beautiful church with a brand new parking lot, but your whole experience is ruined because there are not enough people serving. How many churches does that happen to across America? They come in, the mom comes in and she really wants to be at church and goes to put her kid in the nursery and Hey, there's no nursery, which is why my wife isn't here tonight. Or maybe there's way too many kids to workers, and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to put my kid in there with all those crazy babies, right? But how many times do people miss the gospel because there's not the people there serving to make it happen? How many experiences are ruined because they walk in and see... Yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to be a part of the craziness, especially like if you're like me and you're at Walmart and that happens, you just are like, yeah, I don't need any of this. And you just push your cart and you just end up leaving. How many times has that happened? I wonder how many people we've missed at New Hope because they've come in and just haven't known where to go. 
you're needed. Romans 12, 1, it says this. So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. Why should you serve number seven? Because I owe everything to Christ. I owe everything to Christ. What do you have in your life that hasn't been given to you by God? Oh, well, I, I, I get a nice paycheck that I work really hard for. Oh, how did you get that job? Well, my own talents. Who do you think gave you those talents, right? God has given us everything. He's given us everything we could imagine. And sometimes we have such a hard time saying, ah, to give up an hour a week to serve? That's a lot. I got a busy week. I got a crazy schedule. If you want to be used by God, write this prayer down. It's, it's praying this, God, what can I do for you today? Think about how many prayers are about, God, what can you do for me today? You want to be used. You want God to speak to you. Pray, God, what can I do for you today? And I promise you he's going to speak to you. I promise you he's going to call you to something. He's going to call you to serve in different areas. He's going to call you to serve people at work. He's going to call you to serve people at the store, to to do different things. God will speak to you. Mark 8.35 says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Have you noticed this? That when you live your life trying to make yourself happy, you end up just kind of being miserable. Like when you try to do things like, oh man, this is going to make me so happy if I do this or if I can just get this. And you get that thing and you're like, yeah, this isn't as great as I thought it was. But when you live your life serving people to make them happy, that's a different thing. Like when you're, when you're doing things to serve people. I recently, uh, in the last couple of years, I was blessed by my grandparents. They, they gave me as an inheritance their boat, their speed boat that I grew up going boating on and everything. Well, actually, I kind of earned it a little bit. They had this rule that first grandchild to water ski got the boat. I'm also like four years older than my next closest cousin, so it was kind of easy. But I recently got this boat. My grandpa called me and said, hey, if you want it, come and get it, and it's yours. You know what I found? I found that going out on the lake, like, and just riding the boat around by myself, that's kind of dumb. I was like, this is, this is not fun at all. But you know what's fun? When my family or my kids or my friends come out, I've yet to go tubing on my boat, but I've had more fun having my boat when I'm pulling people on the tube because I'm, I'm getting to serve them. I'm getting to make them happy. When we serve people to, to bring them joy, it's so much different than doing things to bring ourselves joy. If you're a parent, you know this, right? Like, I would, as a parent, I'd way rather do something that I, I don't want to do, but if my son wants to do it and it's going to bring him joy, man, that is way more fun for me than doing something that brings myself joy. Serving people, it, it, it changes everything. Point number eight is this. Serving makes my life meaningful. Kind of building off what I was just telling you. Serving, it makes my life meaningful. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. Nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. Don't you love that thought that serving God is never useless? I've I've noticed that every time I I live my life, every time I, I do something for God, it's never useless or never regretted. Like, there's never been a point where I've given in, to missions and been like, oh, man, I wish I didn't give that much money to missions. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but I've never, I've never regretted giving to missions. I've never regretted serving. Why? Because it, it gives my life meaning. Maybe you're in a spot and you say, well, no one notices when I serve. Maybe you're a parent and you're like, no one notices that I do the laundry all day, every day, laundry, dishes, but can I encourage you that it, it brings meaning when we do it for God? It, it's, it's meaningful. God notices. Something changes when you're part of something bigger than yourself. You know what's kind of cool? In youth on Wednesday nights when we have our big Speed the Light Give nights in, and when it's a, a big night where it's a big offering, that's our biggest friends night that we have because students want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. 
They see what's happening with the water wells. They see what's happening with, with the human trafficking and how we're working to end that. And they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. It, it, it brings meaning. Serving, it, it, makes, it, it brings meaning to your life. Point number nine, I will be held accountable for my service. I will be held accountable for my service. Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Some of you are like, oh man, I can't wait to give an account to God. I'm going to tell him when I was 10 years old, I gave my life to Christ and I did my Devo just about every day. I led a, a little Bible study at my house with my friends and, and he's going to be so proud of me. God's going to say, well, what else did you do? You gave your life to me at that age and you did your Devo, but, but what else did you do? Well, what do you mean? I, I went to church every week. Did you know that coming to church is not you serving God? Right? Us showing up at church isn't like, all right, God, I served you. I showed up to church today. Our worship, it, it serves God. Like, it, it worships him. But it, it's about what, what are we doing? There's a famous quote, and I want to change it around a little bit. Maybe you know it. It's, ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. Anyone ever heard something similar to that before? Not what, not what your church can do for you, but what can you do for your church? We're held accountable. Receiving Jesus, accepting Jesus is great, but I, I think he's going to ask us when we get into heaven, how did you give me away? How, how did you share the gospel? How did you serve? How did people see me in you? John 12, 26. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. The last point is this, so we wrap up. I will be rewarded for my service in eternity. I'll be rewarded for my service in eternity. Notice that verse doesn't say, God's going to reward anyone who was really spiritual for eternity. God's going to reward anyone who has never sinned in a big way. God's going to reward anyone who was a virgin when they got married. It doesn't say that. It says, anyone who serves me. Maybe you're in a spot where you say, well, I just got to get myself cleaned up first. I just got to fix a few things in my life, and, and then I'll be ready to serve. No, I, I would encourage you, start to serve now. If you show up with your life messed up and you serve, God's going to clean you up through it. Right, serving, serving, you'll see, it makes you more like Christ than anything else. And here's the ultimate goal, last verse is Matthew 25, 23. His master replied, well done, my good and faithful Christian, churchgoer, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness, my good and faithful servant. I will be rewarded for my service in eternity. Isn't our goal heaven? Isn't our goal well done, my good and faithful servant? How can you serve? How can you be more like Christ? I want to encourage you, before you leave today, I'm a, we're going to end with just a, a prayer here in just a moment, but I want to encourage you, on our church website, we've been talking a lot about this. It's called Attend One, Serve One, right? Because I don't think that serving is you coming to church also. Like if you're serving in the kids' department on Sunday morning, I don't think you show up for your time to serve in the kids' department and then you go home, but I think you attend one, you come to church at one time, and then you serve in church at one time. Attend one, serve one. And on our website, there's a big bar across the top when you go to newhope.church, and it's this big blue bar that says attend one, serve one. If you click on that, and then you will be directed to a page that will lead you to a whole list of areas that you can click that you're interested in serving. Maybe... This is the ultimate service. You say, I'm going to click every single box, and I'm just here for wherever they need me to serve. And that's great. Some of you, you have the gifts, and you know, like, my gifts are with kids. Some of you are saying, my gifts are not with kids, right? But I encourage you, before you leave, get on your phone or, or hop on the computers out there at the event center and sign up to serve in some area at church. And go beyond serving at church Serve at your house. Husbands, I guarantee you, you ask your wife, how can I serve you today? 
after they wake up from passing out, it'll be a great conversation. But I just want to close with this, and I just want you to pray this prayer. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes. I just want you to pray this prayer to God. God, what can I do for you today? God, what can I do for you this week? Maybe God's going to speak a specific area at church that he wants you to serve. Maybe he's just going to tell you serve at church. Maybe he's just going to tell you serve your spouse. God, what can I do for you this week? How can I serve you, God? I just want you just to listen just for a moment to what God's speaking to you. God, we thank you that you didn't just command us to serve, but you demonstrated to us on how to be a servant. Thank you that you gave your life for us, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate way to serve someone, that that you did that for us. God, I pray that we would be a church that would want to serve you back, that we would want to serve above and beyond what you've called us to do. God, I pray that you would place different things on the hearts of people in here, different things on the hearts of people watching online, of ways that we can serve, of ways that we can make a difference, of ways that we can be a part of something bigger than us, that we would recognize that, that our church family, that it needs us, that we've been gifted for your service, that we've been called, that we've been saved for your service. I pray that you would speak different things to us, different areas, departments, and that we would live a life of service to you. We love you, and we thank you. And we pray, amen. I encourage you, if if God spoke something to you tonight, to to tell someone before you leave, or to get online and to click an area that, that you want to start serving. Because I've noticed lots of times for me, the best action is to tell someone what God just spoke to me, and then that's me being held accountable to that person for when they ask about it later. But I pray that God spoke to you. I pray that you would make that your prayer every day as we wake up. Not, God, what can you do for me today? But God, what can I do for you today? And we would live a life of service. We love you. And we pray you have a great week of serving others around you.